Okay, honor students, we're going to be talking through concept one of our genetics unit on DNA and RNA structure as well as DNA replication. So let's do a little review from about nucleic acids since we learned about macromolecules a few units ago. Um, nucleic acids are one of the four macromolecules and they carry our genetic material. They have genes, and genes are the blueprints or the instructions for making proteins, and their genes are located at certain points on a chromosome. Proteins carry out all cellular activity, so DNA and, other, and RNA are really important nucleic acids because they have the instructions for making these proteins that are going to run your show. There's two types of nucleic acids, DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, um, and RNA, which stands for ribonucleic acid, and they get their names, the deoxyribo versus the ribo, based on the sugar that makes them up. So DNA is made of deoxyribose, and RNA is made of ribose. So nucleotides make up nucleic acids. They are the monomer. Nucleic acids are the polymer. And nucleotides have three parts. Um, sugar, which is this blue piece right here, uh, which is either deoxyribose in DNA or ribose in RNA, like I just said. They have a phosphate, which is this red piece. And then they have a nitrogen base, which is, I made this kind of green rectangular shape, because there's five different nitrogen bases, and they can all be different shapes. So there's adenine, guanine, and cytosine, which you'll find in DNA and RNA. And then there's thymine, which is only in DNA, and uracil, which is only in RNA. So this is one of the ways that we can kind of distinguish DNA from RNA when we're looking at it. So DNA structure, this was discovered by James Watson and Francis Crick in 1953, but it wouldn't have been possible without some imagery taken by Rosalind Franklin, um, who was uh, working in the lab at the time. So this is kind of showing DNA more three-dimensionally, and this is showing it if we just kind of untwisted this and laid it flat out. So DNA structure can be summed up as a double helix, which is what this looks like. It's a twisted ladder, so double meaning has two sides, and helix meaning it's spun up. Has a sugar, it's made of the sugar and phosphate, which we just mentioned, and they form the sugar phosphate backbone. So if you look at this unspun version, you'll see phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, and the same thing on this side. That's why we say it's a sugar phosphate backbone, kind of the sides of the ladder are these alternating sugars and phosphates, Ph phosphates, phosphates, sorry, getting tongue-tied, which we see right there. And then in the middle, the nitrogen bases pair up, and they're held together by really weak hydrogen bonds. Every other bond is a really strong covalent bond, so these bonds all along the sides and right here are strong covalent, but right here in the middle, those are weak hydrogen bonds. All right, those nitrogen bases, we talked about that the pair up, but they only bond with a complementary base pair, and they're held together by hydrogen bonds. So what you'll see is A's always bond with T's in DNA, and C's only bond with G's. So these are like the DNA complementary base pairing rules. Now, a little bit more detail for you honor students about these nitrogen bases. There's two types of nitrogen bases, so purines and pyrimidines. When you think purines, I want you to think this is a smaller word, but it's talking about the bigger bases. So adenine and guanine are bigger bases. They have a bigger shape to them. Pyrimidines are a bigger word, but it's actually the smaller base. Um, cytosine and thymine are the two pyrimidine nitrogen bases. I also remember since pyrimidine has a Y in it, so does cytosine and thymine. So that's kind of how I remember that those go together. So Shargaff is... Um, which is a scientist, and he came up with these rules. He was the one who figured out that A's always bond to T's and C's always bond to G's. So he saw that A's and T's were always in equal amounts and C's and G's were always in equal amounts, which is how he determined they always bonded together. And they're held together by weak hydrogen bonds. I know we've said that over and over. But what you'll see is A is actually double bonded to T, and C and G are triple bonded together. So that's important, too. Another thing about DNA structure that's important is it's, we say that it's anti-parallel. And what we mean there by anti-parallel is that the strands run in opposite or anti-parallel directions. So one of the strands runs in a 5 to 3 prime direction and the other goes 3 to 5 prime. So if you'll see kind of here, the 5 prime side is the side with the phosphate. So I remember that that 5 and phosphate sound similar. So the 5 side is the phosphate side. Then the 3 side is the side that has like the sugar on the end. So over here you'll see 
This side has a sugar, so that's a three prime end. This side has a phosphate, so that's a five prime end. And then the deoxyribose ribose sugar, like I said, is a three prime end. So that's what makes it anti-parallel. This is going to be really important when we get to replication. So I want you to take a few minutes, and um, I want you to label the DNA that is in your notes. Um, try to label it, and then now we're going to go through it together. So this would be the three prime end because it has a sugar on it. That would be the five prime end. Over here, this is my five prime end, and this is my three prime. Right there is pointing to a phosphate. All of those are my sugars, and it's specifically deoxyribose sugar because this is DNA. That is pointing to a strong covalent bond. In the middle here, we're pointing to our bigger nitrogen bases. So those are my purines, which are adenine and guanine. Those are my smaller nitrogen bases. That's my pyrimidines, which is cytosine or thymine. They're held together by weak hydrogen bonds. Right here, that entire thing, that phosphate, that sugar, that nitrogen base is a nucleotide or one of the monomers of the nucleic acid. All right, so those are the types of things you should be able to label about a DNA diagram. All right, RNA structure is a little bit simpler. It's just a single strand of nucleotides that has exposed bases. And RNA bases kind of bind complementarily with DNA bases, but there's a little bit of a difference because there's no thymine in RNA. So we actually have A's bind with U's and C's bind with G's. All right, so try this chart in your notes. I want to go ahead and go through the answer, so pause it so you can try it first. DNA is made of A, T, C, and G. RNA is made of A, U, C, and G. The type of sugar in DNA is deoxyribose. The type of sugar in RNA is just ribose. And then we know the shape of DNA. To summarize it, I mean, we can get in so much detail, but just to summarize, it would be a double helix, and RNA is a single strand. All right, we're going to review some basics of heredity, which we talked about with mitosis, but we'll review them again now to make sure you're hopefully remembering. Chromosomes are tightly coiled strands of DNA, and different organisms have different numbers of chromosomes. So humans, our DNA is coiled into 23 pairs of chromosomes, or 46 total chromosomes. We say it's 23 pairs because 23 of your 46 chromosomes come from mom, and then the other 23 come from dad. Dogs have 37 pairs, so 74 total. 37 from mom, 37 from dad. The number, I don't care if you memorize the number of all the different organisms. You definitely need to know the number for humans. But I just want to show you this to show that the number of chromosomes doesn't really matter in terms of complexity. It's just showing how our DNA is kind of coiled up. Genes are pieces of DNA that have instructions to code for one protein. And one chromosome could have thousands of genes on it. So in summary, genes are pieces or sections of DNA, and chromosomes are long strands of DNA all bunched up or bundled up. I think this picture really summarizes it nicely. So here you can see our DNA, our nitrogen base pairs, and it's in our double helix. And then it gets coiled up. It gets coiled up around these histones or histones, which we won't talk about in terms of structure, but you'll see that's, that's kind of how it gets coiled up so it doesn't get all tangled. And then it coils up more and more and more into a chromosome. Now this is showing sister chromatids. This is showing post S phase of interphase. So we've already doubled our DNA. Then you can see it inside the nucleus of a cell here. But we're going to talk about now how we get these sister chromatids and how they get duplicated during the S phase of interphase. And that's called DNA replication. So a little background. When a cell is ready to divide, we know this from learning mitosis, it first is going to copy its DNA. So it's going to make an identical copy of its DNA and this is called DNA replication. So we're taking DNA and we're making more DNA. The parent DNA is going to make two exact copies of DNA. And this is going to happen in the nucleus because that's where DNA is located. Why does this happen? It happens in the cell cycle before PMAT so that each new cell can have its own full copy of DNA. We want all of our, our cells to be identical when we're doing mitosis and things so that when we're growing and repairing, all of our cells have all the information that they need. This is during the S phase, the synthesis phase of the cell cycle. And it ensures that each new cell is going to have the exactly same DNA as the original cells. So our daughter cells are going to match our original cells. All right. First thing that happens are, and I'm going to highlight a bunch of enzymes as we go through this process. They're going to be in purple. 
So purple is going to represent the enzymes if you want to highlight them in your notes. They're really important. They're going to kind of run this process. So an enzyme helicase unzips the DNA into two strands. So where it opens up, it's called the origin of re origins of replication. So it doesn't just like unzip from the top to bottom. It actually unzips all the way along the DNA. So every place it unzips is an origin of replication. And several places will be unzipped at once. So we have our DNA here, and then it would basically be unzipped, and it would look like this. And this is obviously I'm doing a very small section of DNA. Second, a different enzyme called DNA polymerase is going to add complementary nucleotides to the template strand. So it's going to put T's with A's and A's with T's and C's with G's. So it only, here's really important though, it only adds nucleotides to the free three prime end of the template strand. So it's only forming new DNA strands in the five to three direction only. So as you can see, I'm adding to the three end. I'm adding to the three end, so I'm making a five to three strand. So it's going to keep doing that. All right, it's going in the three, we're making a five to three strand, five to three strand. Now, step two especially needs enzymes. All right, so first enzyme that's really helpful is primase. This is required to make DNA. It's kind of like a key for a card ignition. It kind of tells a DNA replication where to get going. And what it does is it makes a little tiny RNA primer. And that's just a short piece of RNA so that the DNA, it's kind of like a signal for the DNA polymerase to know where it needs to start replicating. Then, once primase has done its job, DNA polymerase comes in. And it's going to add nucleotides to the RNA primer. That's the first thing it does. Then, after all nucleotides are added to the complement strand, the RNA primer gets removed and it's replaced by DNA, which is another thing that DNA polymerase does, so it'll remove the RNA primers. Last, it'll go back and proofread to make sure that it didn't mess anything up. That's its third function, so DNA polymerase is super important. And then fourth, DNA ligase is another enzyme. It's just going to kind of seal any gaps and just going to make sure all the DNA is connected by phosphodiester bonds. Alright, so this is kind of what it looks like. So here we can see this blue triangle is helicase. It's unzipping. DNA primase is right here. Um, it's bringing in the RNA primers. DNA polymerase is this orange box. It's bringing the complementary base pairs. DNA ligase is right here. It's sealing up as we go. Now you'll also notice leading and lagging strands. We're going to talk about those now. So two new strands are being created at the same time. Now, but we know that we're only creating strands in the five to three direction. So because of that, they're kind of going in opposite directions. You'll see this one's forming this way, whereas this one's forming this way. So that creates a leading strand versus a lagging strand. The leading strand is right here. Its new strand is being made towards the replication fork, so towards where this is opening up. So because of this, it only needs one RNA primer to get it, get to get it going. And it's going to be able to replicate continuously because it's, not going, to ha it's going in the direction that the DNA is being unzipped. The lagging strand, though, is being synthesized away from the fork. And again, we have to use the 3 to 5 template because we have to make a 5 to 3. So it's actually going to have to replicate discontinuously. And it creates these fragments of DNA called Okazaki fragments, which are just short little pieces of DNA. Um, they'll get joined together eventually by DNA ligase. It'll kind of stitch them together at the end. But because this is happening discontinuously, we need many RNA primers to kind of get this whole thing going. So this is kind of tricky to visualize, but there are some links at the end of the PowerPoint, um, those of you who have it open, that'll kind of give you some really good animations on the internet where you can kind of see this happening. It's really hard to understand this um, when it's not an animation. So um, if you don't have my PowerPoint, you can just kind of Google some DNA replication animations and you'll find some great stuff. All right, last but not least, the two identical molecules are formed, and each is with an old strand and a new strand, which is why we say DNA replication is semi-conservative. So remember, these outer strands were my original templates. The inner strands are what I brought in using DNA polymerase. But you'll see in the end, I end up with the exact same order of nucleotides um, by doing the process this way. So what do we mean by semi-conservative replication or a semi-conservative model? What we mean is each parent strand is now a template or a pattern, 
that determines the order of the new bases. So let's say this blue ladder is my original DNA. I unzip it and then I bring in new bases, which are my red. My red's my new bases. So my new bases are red for being complementary to the original strand, which is blue. So the newly synthesized double helix is a combination of old and new. And so it still makes those two identical copies. So in summary, if I had to say it in three sentences without all the details, we unzip DNA, enzymes bring in complementary base pairs, ATs and Cs and Gs, and then two identical DNA molecules are formed that are half old and half new. But as honor students, you need to know all those details.